those at quite an advanced age, despite a lot of frailty, have wonderful morale. And people have tried to explain this. But most recently in brain research, people have focused on a part of the brain called the amygdala, which processes emotions. The amygdala with aging favors positive emotions and screens out somewhat negative emotions. And this may be an important explanation to help us understand why morale is so good at those in advanced age. I was working on a project interviewing uh, major figures in 20th century American music. And many places I went, people said, whatever happened to Leo Ornstein? Time is the most elusive thing of all. Is there such a thing as time altogether? There may be nothing more than just this empty thing through which a person lives for a number of years through either to the age of 80, 90, or in my case, an incredible 103. I think I'm closer to 105, but they say nine. They looked it up, and someone's in the little town in the south of Russia. It was written down when I was born. And by God, I am this age. It's scary. Yes, to be 101, maybe 102 or three, but 109, it even scares me. Leo Ornstein's father, I believe, was a cantor, so he had uh, this uh, musical background. Tatif, the brother-in-law, had actually had him play for Josef Hoffmann, a very famous pianist of the time. He showed this incredible talent, and Hoffmann recommended that he go to the conservatory. And of course, this was a huge opportunity for anyone in Russia, especially for someone that was Jewish. Most professions were barred from Jews at this time. They simply could not enter them. And so it was a, uh, you know, they, this was an economic opportunity as much as anything. He went from Kremenchu to St. Petersburg. It was a three-day train ride. He was completely cut off from his own family. In fact, there's one story where uh, as the train was leaving, taking his father back to Kremenchug. He broke away and ran and tried to catch the train and, and didn't. And he never forgot what it felt like to be left in St. Petersburg as a very young boy. Russia was a very dangerous place for Leo and his extended family and for anyone who was Jewish. It was uh, absolutely essential that Leo get out that his family get out if they were to have a future. There are gory, uh, detailed stories of uh, murders and Cossacks coming through and simply beheading people, spearing people. They arrived in February of 1906. He enrolled at the Institute of Musical Art. Mrs. Bertha Firing Tapper decided she wanted this young man as her own, and that began uh, a relationship that was seminal to Ornstein. Um, the family hoped that he would continue to be a protege and, uh, and be a star. Concert artists in those days made a great deal of money. He would sometimes practice 8, 10, 12 hours a day, something like that. He would play a concert, they'd get on a train, he'd take out his silent keyboard, he'd maybe catch a few hours of sleep, he'd practice again right before the concert, and he'd go on. He's so fleet of finger, you know. <laughs> we talk about people being fleet of foot, but he had an easy speed at the keyboard and could simply navigate all 88 without um, breaking a sweat. He would give, at times in one month, maybe 20, 25 concerts. He was traveling constantly. He had his pianos going before him so that they could be in place. Seven pianos that would go ahead of him. He was in demand. Reviews everywhere he goes say, the biggest crowd of the season came out to hear Ornstein over and over again. One critic referred to him as the most salient musical phenomenon of our time. He was, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine how anyone could be more bigger 
and more significant than Ornstein was in those years he concertized. He made a lot of money. Unfortunately for his family, uh, they were not very happy when he began to be a composer. There was absolutely no explanation for what came into his head. He simply heard new sounds and had to play them. He went to a lesson with Bertha Firing Tapper, played them for her. She uh, assumed he had gone mad. He tended to believe she was right. He played the whole piece through a second time, and um, she decided he was not mad, that this was a genuine piece. Regardless, he goes to Europe with Tapper in 1913 and makes quite a splash with new music. They felt that something like Dan Sauvage was really savage and, um, and dangerous because they, they had not heard anything like this. Einstein, who was seen to be a messenger from, uh, from another world, really, as that, the way they, they wrote about him. Uh, people were fascinated. He was criticized severely, but that made him more and more popular. There was a tremendous amount of uh, uh, adverse reaction. Uh, some were terribly stimulated by the things, you see. Uh, as some uh, were stimulated by the the general sound of the thing, it wasn't that they really understood its sheer musical value, but the volume and a thousand other things that, uh, and some were outraged altogether where they would throw things at me. Dan Savage became like his calling card. It was sort of like a modernist anthem for four or five years. It became a huge, huge fan favorite uh, during the 1910s. People were aware that there was something that was going to change the course of music and the arts forever. All of the old traditions were going to be turned over into what became known as modernism. Not only was he the most important composer of what was called modern music, he was the only one at that time. At times I have to they tell you, where's it all come from? I said, now, now, you are, now you're asking the $64 question. Why, you should have heard what you did. You never can explain, never. But I certainly heard that. Here's the evidence. <laughs> Ornstein particularly felt he was a conduit, um, a channel, you know, for these ideas that came from somewhere, and he felt this was a gift. And then he would laugh about it and say, a gift, but a terrible bother. <laughs> He'd like, I'd like to go out fishing, but I have to stay here and get these sounds out of my head. What are you going to do when ideas do crowd into your head and uh, keep tormenting you until you finally get it down on paper? I think Leo's music, his best music, has a kind of truthfulness to it. It sounds immediately conceived. It sounds inevitable. There's a rhythmic energy and drive that pulses and pushes you through the piece and you say it couldn't have been any other way. Yes, there are these sounds that are kind of clanking, but they are always atmospherically clanking. I don't hear them as sounds that are simply clanking for clanking's sake. They serve a purpose. He hears beautiful, thick, rich timbres, very full timbres. Um, and then out of that full, rich sonic landscape, this melody will come wailing. And it seems like the most natural thing. You felt that he knew what he was doing, what he wanted to do, 
and there was nobody going to stop him. Now I cannot take this off. But I couldn't possibly think uh, the, each, uh, uh, the left and the right hand in, in sequence uh, uh, as fast as I can simply just make it simply, uh, in other words, make my arms move yes. that rapidly. And that is why there have been so many disasters sometimes when the syncopation, you see, uh, 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 get closer and closer. And finally, the, uh, the, uh, the, particularly in the orchestra, you've got to be very, very careful because obviously there's a point at which they simply cannot come in uh, in such a, a small area. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried that? It's very funny. You, uh, you can do it yourself. Just take a pencil or any one of us. Uh, take a pencil and do this to it and then say, ah, 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 ah. And then finally what happens to your arsenal, of course, will run back together with your... Uh... In other words, you cannot think they're in between your beats. There are some days when it doesn't matter what I think. I simply just find utterly unpalatable and I simply refuse to use it. I just don't feel it's, uh, that it's good enough, that it's, uh, it doesn't satisfy my, uh, uh, my critical e evaluation, just uh, re refuses to accept it. And sometimes the danger, of course, you understand with the, uh, with the composer being overcritical, he can annihilate himself completely. One has to be very careful not to become obsessed with one's own style. But the story is not as simple as it sounds. One of the mysteries of Leo's life is that he dropped out of the public eye at the peak of his career. He left New York to open a music school in Philadelphia raised a family, and 50 years later, he was rediscovered, living in a trailer park in Brownsville, Texas. That's when Vivian Perlis began to uh, support and promote Ornstein. At that point, he starts writing again, and that happened when he was in his early 80s. When he began to compose again as an old man, his wife Pauline became his collaborator. When I met the woman that became my wife, that probably was the high point of, but that is the high point of many human beings. And she was a very rich young American, and I was a poor, the proverbial poor artist, you know, practically penniless, and she was loaded, but it didn't matter. We got together, and there's something that's known as falling in love, and we fell in love with each other. And she said, we'll make it, we'll make it. And they had a, a symbiotic kind of relationship that uh, where somehow he could dictate what he wrote and, and it would be in Pauline's hand. Uh, Pauline, uh, uh, this is going to be in 2-4 time. Now, the upper line, uh, yes, it's in treble and bass, that's right, mm -hmm. and it's through four time. Now you'll see very simple. Uh, you go to the A flat, put in the top line A flat, the extra line A flat, for an eighth, and now you're going to have two sixteenths, the B flat and the A flat again. Go down to E for a quarter, and close your measure up. Uh, on a good day, when he has these ideas floating around, uh, he'll get up after breakfast and start on one. And while I'm trying to get down just a little of that, another one comes into his head. Mm -hmm. And then another one, and sometimes three and four in one morning. I think when I she, once wrote you, I was swamped. And to pin him to one of those to finish it out, every time he gets busy on one, he thinks of another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have just thousands of pages of half-finished things because they came in clumps.
But I do know that when she died, I experienced a loss and a grief that I knew nothing about prior to that. No, the only thing that will obliterate it now is myself being dead. That's why I don't fear death at all. I rather welcome it now. I think myself, uh, this looking for the meaning of life is something extraneous. I think life, the way we lead it, is the meaning. Trying to seek for an inner meaning is a myth. Is there some power behind, for a better word, called God? Who knows? Who knows? Leo wrote to me one time was on the occasion of his 100th birthday. Dear Vivian, he wrote, um, I am beginning to feel my age. Just beginning. Um, I always thought there would be some kind of epiphany uh, that would happen before I died, but I realize now that is not going to happen. I think he, he wrote me again when Pauline died that I can't possibly go on. A year later, he was composing a sonata of major proportions, that last sonata, that piano sonata that he, he wrote. He was happy, and he was not um, out of it at that age. And in fact, his family told me that he was a little happier than he had been during the earlier years of his life. Yes, I do hear things in spots here and there that remind me of the old days, but this complete coordination I not, don't really have, I have it in spots now, and I wake up at night and I write down a few things, but it hasn't got the, the connection. You can go past Leo's room and you can hear him humming and I don't think he's even aware that he's humming but he just has this thing that comes to his mind I'm sure and it just flows out as probably how he wrote his music how it just flowed because he'll always tell you I don't know where it came from it just came. For you to hear certain things to see certain things the truth of it is that no one knows that's really in the hands of the gods, as they say. Why you should have heard what you did, you never can explain, never.